Well, good morning. Here we are, alive and well at Calvary Chapel, St. Mike's. <laughs> Let's worship the Lord. Let's pray. Ah. Father, once again, it's just good to be together with brothers and sisters to worship you. And that's what we want to do, Lord. To forget about the things in this world and the stuff and whatever, Lord. And just focus on you, Jesus. Our Lord, our Savior, you, Lord, who love us so much. We just want to lift you up this morning and bless you. And we know, Lord, that as we do that, that you will minister your word to our hearts. And thank you for that. So have your way in each one of us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's all stand if we can and worship the Lord this morning. And, and, yeah, that's, that's your option back there. <laughs>
get up in the morning, helps me get dressed. If my clothes don't match today, it's her fault. She, she did her best. Uh, John chapter 2. John chapter 2. To amplify a little bit about tonight's men's fellowship, we're going to be talking about the things that God showed us at the men's retreat this week. So if you weren't at the retreat, it'd be a good time to find out what happened. Well, yeah, a lot happened. It was good. So come on out tonight at 6.30. <sighs> John chapter 2. Jesus now is going to do his first miracle. We all know that is turning water into wine. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's just read this, verses 2 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine for until now. This, beginning of his signs, Jesus said in Cana of Galilee, and and his and oops, sorry. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. 
After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Lord Jesus, once again, we ask you to minister your word to our hearts. This is your word, minister. Maybe the things I have to say mean nothing, but your word is the one that changes lives. So please do that. In Jesus' name, amen. At that time, a marriage ceremony lasted for seven days. A seven-day party. And the bride was not seen during those seven days. They would party and feast for a week. They would just enjoy each other's company. But the bride and groom, they were kind of on a seven-day honeymoon. They were in, a, a, in one of the rooms, but nobody would see them. They would, if she would be gone. Nobody would see her for a week. And that's a picture. It's a picture of the body of Christ being married to the Lord Jesus. Because we are his bride. And there's going to be a seven year kind of little honeymoon for us. Seven year represents seven days, seven years. For us during this seven year tribulation that's going on on this earth. We're going to be hidden away and protected by the Lord with him in heaven. And just as this groom, after seven days, is going to bring his bride in and introduce him, the Lord is going to bring us with him to the earth and do the same thing. We'll be carried away into heaven with the Lord for seven years. At the end of seven years, when Jesus comes back with his bride in Jude, it says he will come back with tens and thousands of his saints. And that's us when he comes back. Now, the Old Testament weddings symbolized the coming of the Messiah and we see in Matthew 25 just an example of that the story of the virgins I'm not going to get into the, the uh, details of the story of the virgins but the idea of it here let me read to you Matthew 25 verses 1 through 6 it says then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. See, in those days, they didn't know when the groom was coming. The bridegroom, they didn't know when the man was coming for the woman. It was going to be a secret. She had to be ready at any time for he was going to come. And she didn't know what day it was. Kind of what Jesus said about his second coming. We are not going to know the day. But we need to be ready. And so, they're waiting. And some of them are ready. Some of them aren't ready. And it says, five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their laps, they took no oil with them, representing the Holy Spirit. But the prudent took oil in the flask along with the lamps, representing the Holy Spirit. Another teaching, not really, not going to get into this morning. But now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. So they're waiting, they're kind of waiting for the bridegroom, and then all of a sudden, you know, well... When's he going to come? He's probably not going to come today. So they're getting lazy and they're going to go to sleep. Kind of, you know, similar to what happens to many Christians as we wait for the Lord. And say, well, you know what? He's probably not going to come now. So uh, we get a little lazy maybe in our walk with the Lord and, you know, or in our devotions and things like that with the Lord. And then boom, there he is. Because that's how he's going to come. Bam. And we're going to whoop. Matter of fact, oh, you know what? Something wonderful happened to me during worship, which hadn't happened to me in quite a while. We were singing, Thou art worthy. And all of a sudden, I just got this intense sense that Jesus was coming back right then. It was, it was awesome. I don't know how to explain to you, but it was way cool. My turns. <laughs> you know, I remember that used to happen to me quite often. Uh, you know, just that sense of, I'm going to open my eyes and Jesus is going to be there. Oh, bummer. And there was sometimes I knew it. I knew, oh man, we're in the presence of the Lord. He's coming to get us. We're really there right now. You know, and be totally disappointed. But then it continues and says, Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight... There was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Boom, and they wake up quick. They had to be ready when he came. That's the picture. 
in the Old Testament of the of the Messiah, waiting for the Messiah to come, waiting now for us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And with that anticipation, not to get lazy, to be ready for it. So then back to John chapter 2, verse 3 says, When the wine ran out, all the people are partying, you know, having a good time, but the wine ran out, the wine representing joy and fun. The mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. Interesting. The wine in those days was a very important part of their festivities, their marriage festivities. And it was a very serious thing to run out of wine. It was so serious that the family of the groom who paid for it, and, and in those days, you know, nowadays, the weddings are more about the bride, right? The, the, the woman. Those days it was about the groom. And it would be such a, a disgrace for a family if they ran out of wine at the party. So much so that people, if they desire to, could have a legal claim and sue them for ruining the party, I guess. I don't know. But it was a very serious, serious issue. A, a major blot on a family family's reputation. Embarrassing. Now, some people take this scripture and say, see, it's okay to drink and that. And yeah, you know, it, it is okay. There's no one in the Bible that says you can't have a, a beer or a glass of wine or something. It does very, it does say do not get drunk. So, you know, that's serious. For me, I'll tell you my personal, for my life, personally, I don't touch it at all. Then I don't have to worry about getting drunk. Because I'm one of those guys and I don't drink a wine. I drink until I can't, until I can't walk. That's just kind of how I, well, I probably, maybe not now, but when I was younger, that's how it was. And so I, I just don't touch it at all. I stay away from it. Uh, it also for me personally, as a pastor of a church, many people look at uh, somebody who drinks any type of alcohol. Well, they're not Christians, you know, and it, and, and it can stumble people. It also, for me, if I have a drink, possibly if somebody's struggling with drinking and they see me drinking, oh, well, it's okay. And I stumble them in their life. So personally, it's okay for you to, I'm telling you, you know, I'm not telling you you can't, but for me personally, I stay away from it completely, 100%. The only alcohol that comes in my body is in maybe some medication or uh, beef stroganoff, which I haven't had here in years. So that, you know, a little cooking wine, that, that's it. Does that have alcohol in it? Cooking wine? A little, I, mean, I don't even know if it does. Just for a little flavor thing, right? Personally, I can't stand a taste of wine alcohol. God just delivered me from it completely. But, but you know, there are scriptures in the Word. And in Proverbs, go ahead, turn to Proverbs 23, verse 29. Because alcohol is a problem in the world today with many people. Many people. And a lot of Christians. And a lot of people say they're Christians. And a lot of people are alcoholics and, you know, addicted to it. So... There are warnings. Proverbs 23, 29 says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Ask all these questions, you know. Who's got all these problems? And then it goes on to tell you, those who linger long over wine. Those who drink too much. Those who go to taste mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your mind will utter perverse things. And you'll be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea or like one who lies down on the top of a mast. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When, I, when shall I awake? I will seek another drink. I mean, well, we all know people like that. Maybe we've been there. Go, wow, man, did we party last night? Yeah, I hugged that toilet for about three hours, puking my guts up. It was so much fun. Yeah, give me another drink. You know? Bible warns us. That's all I'm saying about that stuff. Okay. So Mary says this to her son, Jesus here. 
she says, they have no wine. Maybe she's saying it for different reasons. You know, I don't re really know, you know, but you know, Mary, we, we have to understand that Mary, Jesus's mother, at, she, after she had Jesus, she was a tainted woman. She was put down. People gossiped about her because she was pregnant before she was married. And that did not happen in those days. So she was gossiped about. I mean, we all think of you know Mary like this smooth life. She got Jesus, you know, hey, found him at the temple. Yay, all the good stories. But I think her life was pretty hard. The other women shunned her a lot. She probably had very few women friends because of that. She was human like us, and it probably hurt. And she might have even, you know, maybe, and, and you know, she heard what the angel said to her, and, and she knew that her son was special. She knew. And in her mind, she might be going, show who you are. Show who you are. And, and maybe would it exonerate her. You know, you know, possibly, because that's how I am. Come on, Jesus, I want you to show up right now so you can show these people that it's the truth. Bam! You know, and she's human. You know, Mary sinned. You hear that? Mary sinned, you guys. Oh, no. Yes, yes. I say that in some circles and I hear, oh, she did. She was like us. Maybe Jesus could prove he is who he is and the truth will be known about her then, right? Try, you know, have you ever, like I said, you know, sometimes you just feel like wish Jesus would do something to vindicate you. Aha, see, he came back, you know. Well, not quite the, not quite the right attitude because you want people to be saved, not to show them and send them off to hell. See, you're going to hell now, man, you know, we don't want that. We don't, really, we should not want anybody to go to hell. We should not want anybody to be separated from the, from the Lord God. Even people we don't like, maybe somebody you hate, you still should pray for them, that God saves them. But you know what? In God's timing, He will vindicate us. He will show who He is. Guess what? It is just not His time yet. It's just not his time. As a matter of fact, what's he say there in verse 4? After he's, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. It's not time yet. See, Jesus wasn't on his schedule. He wasn't on his mother's schedule. He was on the Father's timetable. And when the Father said it's time, it's time. And in the term woman there, it almost... You know, you look at that and you go, is he being rude to his mother? You know, like, like maybe we would, woman, you know? No, he wasn't. Uh, that term there, woman, was a term of respect in those days. It, it's a, it, it's like dearest, mom, you know? I mean, it, was, it wasn't a put down. Because sometimes you can look at it and that's what it looks like. In our eyes. It's a term that you would say to someone who's very close to you. But he tells her, not yet. You know, there was a commercial, I can't remember what it was, I think it was in the 70s and 80s. And yeah, 70s and 80s. It was Orson Welles, and he did a commercial for, for uh, this winery, Paul Mason Winery. And he do, did these commercials, and, and you know, in one of the sayings he said there, he says, they will sell no wine until it's time. Yeah, they would let those grapes, you know, ripen perfectly and then ferment and do their thing. Now, I lived in wine country in Northern California where people always come to wine tasting and all that. And, you know, they had special wines. They waited so long and, you know, they, they, they had a special process so that their wine would be good. So they would not sell it until it was time. You know, there's that long process. There's the farming. There's the growing, picking, smashing, fermenting. Until that wine went in that bottle. And then they would sit it on the shelf for a season. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's, he can't do what he wants to do on his own schedule. It's going to be the schedule when the, the Father's time is right. And then that hour would come. And that hour is coming when he will prove to everyone 
who he was. Going to that cross, dying in that cross, and coming out of that grave. That was, that was the time, for sure. And he showed everyone, and every one of us today. You know, a lot of times when Jesus ministered, great things happened. Healings happened. Leopards were cleansed. And, and things were happening. And, and people would get really excited. And, and Jesus, Jesus would say to them, don't tell anybody. Well, you know, it's like, if, if I lay hands on somebody and they get healed, and, the, and somebody says, don't tell anybody. How can you not tell somebody? That's exciting when God moves like that. But he told them that. Why? Because it wasn't his time yet to be revealed as the Messiah. The one who would save them from their sins. Keep it quiet. Sometimes the demons would say, we know who you are. And Jesus would silence them. So they wouldn't say it. But the day of his triumphal entry when he came in to Jerusalem on that day, on that Palm Sunday when he came in, that was the day. Hosanna! Hosanna! Here is the Messiah! Here he is! And all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders, you know, they said, shut him up! That's blasphemy! Stop them from saying this! Because they didn't believe it. But what did Jesus say to them? They said, you know what? If these shut up, the rocks will cry it out. I kind of wish they'd all shut up. I, I don't know how a rock... I, I just got a cartoon mind, you know. <clears throat> I see this this rock, and then it, all of a sudden the mouth appears on it and goes, Hold on! <laughs> I, I can't wait to see that. <clears throat> when the trees clap their hands, you know, and, you know, oh man, it's going to be exciting. Now, in verse 5 here, John 2, we're going to see Mary says the last thing that she says, that we hear her say. And what she say in verse 5, she says, His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. That's the last recorded thing that Mary said. And what is it? Listen to him. Do what my son says. That's what she would say to you and I today. Listen to Jesus. Listen to my son. Follow his instructions. Do whatever he says. And so Mary, his mother, all of a sudden is, is there's a reversal happening. There's something happening here where no longer does she have that role of, of just mother of the Messiah. But now she is becoming a disciple of Jesus. Yes, she's his mother, but she still was a disciple of Jesus. And it seems like that's the turning point right here. It looks appears to be that way. She's becoming an obedient disciple. She didn't argue with him. She didn't tell him, well, no, why don't you do it? You know, she became an obedient disciple. Now, her new position her new position in Christ going from mother to disciple is actually a better position. It's a higher position because look, listen, what did John say? John said in uh, John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 1 through, 1 through 14 in that scripture, he says, or Jesus said, I'm sorry, Jesus said, those who do the will of my father are greater than John the Baptist. A better position. Those who are following Jesus are better than John the Baptist. Before he followed the Lord there, right? So Jesus loved his mother. He respected her. But he didn't take those directions from her. Whatever she was saying to him at that time, he was going to do what the Father and how the Father directed him. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, it says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. Everything in the proper time. That's how it is in our lives when we walk with the Lord. That the things happen at the right time. You pray and you pray and you pray. You say, Lord, why isn't it happening now? And then boom, it happens. It happens at the right time. 
Many times for us, those prayer, prayers are answered at the 11th hour, the very end. When our patience is finally got, you don't have any more. Do you guys all pray for patience? God bless you, brother. Seems to me I don't have to pray for them. I just get them. <laughs> they just happen. All right, Benny. Well, verse 6 through 10 here, back in John. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and take take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. Now when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. You know, Jesus does all things well. He does them good. No shortcuts. So when he makes the wine, it's the best wine. I, I probably wouldn't even mind tasting that wine. And I don't even like wine at all. But I, I bet you it tasted like Welch's grape juice or something, you know. I bet you it was just a little bit different. I, I don't know. But you see that. And I mean, he could have made it average. He could have done whatever. But he made it the best. And what a lesson for us to do that for the Lord and the, the things in our life, to do it to the best of our ability. You know, I always talk about Anna, how she does that so much so that I had a hard time, you know, talking to my brother Ryan here to put that fence up there, you know, uh, out the front because he says, well, I want to, I don't want, I want it to be good for Miss Anna. <laughs> so I'm not going to say anything about her. But he did a wonderful job putting that up. Thank you. Not trying to steal your reward. Just mention that. Give our best to the Lord. Now, you also notice there, when the servants listened to the Lord and they went and filled it up, they did their best. They didn't just fill it up, you know, up to just to the top. They filled it to the brim. They also went all the way and filled it right to the top doing their best and they did it obediently and enthusiastically like you can tell they did that if they did it just half-heartedly they might have put three quarters in or whatever you know but they did that not halfway not being lazy jesus looks for us to be like that looks for people to be like that there those servants are obedient they go and fill the jars they listen to the lord they went and filled them and they were excited filling them to the brim and then they had to be patient to watch what's all going on fill those with water what does that mean I, I don't know if they were sitting there wondering, he's going to turn it into wine. They probably thought, these people are going to be really disappointed when they take a drink of this stuff. Because <laughs> it's water. It's not going to fool them very well, you know. I mean, that's what I would have been thinking. So they're being patient. And the Lord's patient with us. He, he gives us one step at a time, uh, doing things many times. He doesn't give us the whole plan. But this is the beginning of his miracles. We see there in verse uh, verse 11 and 12, it says, This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and, his, and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. <clears throat> and after this, he went down to Capernaum. But I, I bet if you were there and you saw this, <clears throat> I, you know, that, that's pretty impressive, turning water into wine. I, you know, I don't know. I've, I've, I'm telling you, I've prayed many, many, many times in my life. Because I like Coca-Cola. And some places you would go in the United States, they would have a thing called Pepsi. I know you guys know what that is here because they don't allow it in the country. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> but I would go into a restaurant, you know, and, and if they would serve Pepsi, Pepsi. I would go, oh, I'd like, I would like a Coke. And they would say, we have Pepsi. And I would tell them, then I'll ask Jesus to turn it into Coke. I don't remember him ever doing it, but I asked. And here he is. He does this miracle, this first miracle at a marriage ceremony. And you know, that blesses me because it's just putting the stamp on God's way. You see, 
that institution, marriage institution came from God. And man did not invent it. And a marriage in God's kingdom, in God's way, is a man and a woman. Flat out, that's it. That is marriage in God's kingdom. Marriage in the world is something different now. And you know what? They do what they do. They just do it. But real marriage in the Lord is a man and a woman. It's very clear in the Bible. And so Jesus is putting a stamp of approval on God's institution of marriage here by doing this. You know, some people would say, well, why get married? I mean, you know, in the States for many years, there's that saying, well, you need, you, you test drive a car before you drive it. So we need to you know, test each other out, make sure, you know, we're compatible before we get married. No, no, no. That's not God's way. God's way is marriage. Then drive. And he didn't do the miracles so that people would glorify the miracles and you know and that, that kind of a thing he he did them to, to show and prove his glory and, the, and to show the power that he had that he was god and it did show his power and that would happen it would build the faith of the people that saw it, like his disciples here they believed in him maybe some of them were having those doubts like you know who really is he who is you know we're following him we're his disciples and we're with him and you know, and then all of a sudden come, bam! Yeah, we believe. And sometimes it takes a shaking like that in our lives for us to believe. You know, I, I, yeah, you know, we, we had to, we're at this men's retreat this week. And it's up on this road that you just don't even want to drive on, unless you're, you know, from the Mennonite community. Just look out, you know, with your four-wheel drives and stuff. And it, it's a pretty bad road. And, but you can do it. You just have to do it slowly, rocks, you know, through the grooves and you know all that kind of stuff, and get your co-pilot next to you, tell him rock to the right, rock to the left, you know, sit down, fight, fight, fight. I'm a co-pilot there, leading the way, and then you know we get there, and the only thing you don't want to happen is, please don't let it rain, because that road is that red clay; it turns into slick mud like ice. Just don't let it rain. But we get to the retreat, and guess what? It starts raining. So, maybe not the men with me, but being the driver of the van, I'm like, uh-oh. Are we going to get off the hill, God? <laughs> you know, and then, and then I have all these guys tell me these horror stories. The Mennonite guys that go up there for the vacation stuff. Yeah, we got stuck here two days because of the mud on the road. And I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> when they had four-wheel drives, we couldn't get out. You know, and I hear four stories in a row. The, the morning I wake up and I'm going... This is really good. Lord, please don't let it rain. Please don't let it rain. So we go to the first session. We're sitting there. You know how it is, the rain on the metal roofs. It's raining, Lord. Then it stops. We go into the second session. Rains. So my mind's going, Lord, I'm giving it to you. It's okay. My, my main concern is I can't talk to my wife and tell her, you're doing the service tomorrow. Because <laughs> I'm not coming home. And, you know, that's going on in my mind, things like that, you know, my, my, but I'm praying, Lord, you, you, you'll get us home. I know we'll get home. We can leave the van here, go down with those guys and get a bus back, whatever. It'll all happen. It's okay. Because, you know, I have to be the spiritual leader and show all these young guys, it's okay, you know, praise the Lord. And, you know, so they don't see me going, man, get him out of here. Like a few of the pastors, <laughs> not naming names. Two of the pastors left early because they were afraid. Because it wasn't it wasn't quite raining at lunch, so they said, we're getting out of here. We gotta make sure we get out of here. So they left the retreat early. Oh, uh, I, well, I can't wait to see them face to face and call them names. Chicken, oh, man of faith, you know. Uh, I mean, that's okay, I understand why. I, I, I kind of want to get out of there too, but at the same time, I wanted the guys with me to get ministered to. I knew there were more a, a good message coming, so we'll stay. So I said, Lord, we're just in your hands. You can, you can make the skies blue if you want. And then the last session happens, the skies turn blue and the clouds move away. You know, you, you can go, am I right? I go, thank you, Lord. Thank you for answering that prayer. And it, and it was about 45 minutes of time, so it dried the road up a little bit. And it was, thank you, Jesus. And sometimes, you, you know, you think, 
Did God really do that? Yeah. Was that a coincidence? No. And your faith is built a little bit. You know what? I was really dependent on that. Lord, I'm believing you. You're getting us out of here. You can make the sky blue. I mean, I was doing that. Uh, I even missed part of the message praying. <laughs> and then we're driving out. And it's still slick. And there's wet spots and slick. But, you know, it's <laughs> it's better when the other two pastors left. <laughs> I, could, I saw these car tracks. I go, I bet you that's theirs. And they were like cut in the mud. You can see these real trails. Like they had a hard time getting out of here. Anyhow, story for the sideline. But you know what? It, it it built my faith. I hope everybody who's with us, the young guys, saw that and say, "Look what the Lord did." We'll talk about that tonight because the Lord did that. Now He didn't have to do that, and if He didn't, He blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? We sing that song. Blessed be the name of the Lord, whether He does it or whether He doesn't do it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But back. Showing his power. I got so out there, I got to come back to here, back to earth, here, back to this. Oh, gee, I'm in Luke 24. Doggone fans, what are they doing here? I'm looking for one more. Oh, signs. This is the beginning of the signs in verse 11 there. I want, I want to share with you that the signs, the word in the Greek is simeon or simeon or something like that. And it means sign, right? And, and what is a sign? A sign is something that you see that points somewhere. So when Jesus, when signs and miracles happen, they should point to Jesus. Not us or really what happened, but they should point to Jesus. And, and, and you see this in John. What are the signs in John? What's their purpose? You know, it, it wasn't so Jesus looked like this magician, this, you know, doing a show. It wasn't that kind of a thing. He was pointing to something greater. It, it's kind of an outward manifestation of God's presence with us. When you see a sign, like the sky is going blue. I mean, that's just God doing that for us. It's transforming. When he did this miracle, what happened? There was a transformation from water to wine. And when we see signs and wonders, we are transformed. We are changed. And they're there for us to, to be changed. To be made different. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old things have passed away. God makes everything new and that's what he does. We are new creation in Christ, every one of us. That's a miracle. And we should point to Jesus. See, it wasn't enough for the people just to believe in the works of Jesus, but to believe in him and his father who sent him. That's what it's all about. That's what the signs are there for. Now, we're going to see as we go through John here, that many of the signs in the gospel, in it, it took cooperation with people. They were a part of it. You see that in this scripture here. You know, the servants getting the water, you know, or someone, you, you go down and take some, put this mud in your eye, and then you'll see. You know, those, there was cooperation with people on some of these signs. And that's the way it is today. When signs and wonders happen here, it takes cooperation with us. We need to go and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. To pray for someone or whatever. Or Lord, <laughs> make the skies blue. Or whatever it may be. But we're part of it. We don't cause it. He's the one that does, but we can ask in, in that cooperation with him. And when that happens, our faith will be built in huge ways. Man, I've, I've seen so many signs and wonders in my life, I might, you know, not a lot. It's not like every day there's some big, of course, taking a breath of air is, is a miracle, but, you know, the things that we consider miracles and things, I, I've seen many of them in my days of walking with the Lord. And they've encouraged me, and, they, and I knew it was Jesus. And I've been part of many signs and wonders that have happened, and I still, it was Jesus. And they glorified Him. And we see that with His first miracle right here 
So you know, I, I would encourage you not to be afraid to pray for the Lord to move in your life. To pray for people, for God to do things. Now, I mean, you don't have to seek after the signs and wonders. You don't have to seek after healings. You don't have to call a healing meeting to have people healed. You just know if somebody's sick, you can pray for them, and maybe God will heal them if that's His will at that time. It's just being willing to be used by the Lord and to have that relationship with the Lord so you can hear His voice. You see, if we're all cluttered with the stuff of the world, you don't hear the voice of the Lord very good. And because of that, we'll miss opportunities to be used by the Lord. So it's important for us to really just surrender our lives to the Lord. You know, yes, we live them. We can, we can enjoy our lives. But enjoy them with Him so that He can use us. And Lord, we thank You for that. We thank You that You desire to use clay vessels, dirt, to do your work here on the earth. And it's just an amazing thing when you do use us. Sometimes we're in awe like, wow, Lord, you even use me. Thank you, Lord. But that is your desire. So help us again, Lord, just to walk with you in, in an intimate way, in a personal way. And to be observant and to be ready. Be ready to be used by you. Be ready for your second coming. That we would hear that trump, Lord, and, and you would call us to be with you. That we would just be ready, Lord. Because your word is true, and these things are going to happen. So even now, Lord, we want to pray for our village here of St. Bite, Lord. Again, we pray you would reach out and pour your spirit on this village. Minister to people in this village. Lord, I, I see you. I see you working in this village. I see you bringing more people to help from the outside, Lord to minister in this village. And I thank you for that, Lord. That's the answer to prayer. And that you will anoint all those who come here, Lord, to share the gospel. They would be pointing to you. And that the local people here, Lord, would get it. They would surrender their lives to you. And they would be doing the same thing, Lord. And they would go to other villages and in their country, Lord, and share Jesus and lead people to you, Lord. And they would be the leaders. Father, that is our heart. So save many, Lord. Grow them, Lord. Strengthen them. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. Well, God bless you. Have a great day, great week in the Lord, man. And men, we'll see you tonight. It's going to be exciting.